So um, we, um, we planned this conference uh, more than a year in advance, and it's been uh, an absolute uh, uh, gift to get to know some of the, uh, the, the, my co-chairs and the, some of the presenters. Um, our next uh, presenter is a very well-known uh, surgeon and is our keynote lecturer, and that is um, Dr. Uh, John Holcomb. Um, John Holcomb is the director for the Center of Translational Injury Research at the University of Texas in Houston. And um, he, is, uh, he has a, a host of, uh, of uh, titles, but I think probably the most impressive are the fact that he's vice chair of the department and that he is a professor of surgery and he is the Jack uh, Mayfield uh, chair in surgery. Um, additionally, um, he has, uh, he's a reviewer for 23 uh, journals. He's on the editorial board of four journals. He has received more than 15 military uh, awards, including the Bronze Star and the uh, Combat uh, Medal. Um, I could go on and on about him, but I will tell you that, um, that uh, what his contribution has been to trauma has been absolutely phenomenal. And so with that, I will let him uh, talk with you guys. Thank you. Welcome. Great. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Um, that's for you. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here in this lovely uh, facility. We're going to talk about the evolution of trauma resuscitation over the last 153 years, from 1864 to 2017. Paula, we were talking about the Civil War earlier, and we will continue to do so. Just a little epidemiology and um, talking about injury. I don't need to really do this much for this group, but injury is a really big deal. It is, uh, accounts for over 5 million deaths per year. And which exceeds the number from HIV, TB, and malaria combined. And these injuries are increasing across the world. The WHO suggests it will be the number one cause of death in the next several years. When do patients die? When do patients die? We all know Don Trunke's work from uh, uh, 20 or so years ago, talking about the trimodal distribution of death. And if you look at deaths now in multiple people, and some of them in the audience have, have published this, there really is a unimodal distribution. These are over 1,000 deaths in our hospital, and you can see that most of the deaths occur early. <clears throat> the little blow up there in the circle shows that most of the deaths occur in the first hour after injury. These are after admission to the hospital. And then tail off pretty quickly, but continue on out at a pretty steady rate on out to over five weeks. If you break that out even farther, that first couple, that first uh, blow up and look at the first day, you can see really that deaths occur in the first one to four hours after admission. So it is really a, a truism that minutes really do count in this uh, after injury. Now, how do we stop bleeding? How do we break the cycle of death? And it's um, some of, many of us in the room and across the audience have participated in studies where you take one little variable and see if that changing that one variable makes a difference. But that's not how we practice, is it? We use a lot of different things. We use different types of tourniquets, dressings, catheters, blood products, uh, both blood and also concentrates. And then just to remind ourselves in that middle right-hand corner on your screen, <clears throat> we actually do surgery to stop bleeding as well. 
The, uh, by combining all of those things together, and this is, these are retrospective data, what we have shown in our center is by combining all those hemorrhage control modalities, we've decreased hemorrhagic death by 30 percent over the last 10 years or so, with uh, hemorrhage decreasing from 36 to 25 percent of all deaths in our hospital. So we can make a difference, you know, if you put all of these together. Now, from a blood point of view, where do we start uh, resuscitating with blood products? Because we think blood is important. Well, that's we start pre-hospital. So everything I'm going to tell you, and we'll weave through here, the blood story not only starts in the operating room with the emergency department, but pre-hospital as well with red cells and plasma on the helicopter. In RED, uh, after starting pre-hospital, you come in, and that's our tray of the blood products in the emergency department. You get red and gold stuff in our ED. You get no clear fluids. Uh, if you're in hemorrhagic shock, we think that's pretty important. The, uh, this evolution, if you kind of look at this little timeline, and this is going to frame our discussion today, in 1864, and I'm sorry for the typo there, whole blood uh, was first used. You went through several wars, and this is U.S.-centric, uh, World War I and World War II. In the 70s, we broke whole blood up into components. I think we got distracted a little bit. I'll go through those data. And then back in, in the mid-2000s, uh, started giving balanced resuscitation again and ending up uh, with whole blood and dry plasma. Now, the, uh, Dr. Todd Maxon is in the audience, and this uh, slide he's seen before. The first, episode, the first example of whole blood I can find in the United States was in 1864 uh, in the Civil War to Private Gross, who had his amputation and was transfused two ounces, or 60 milliliters, on 15 August in 1864. The donor was a strong, healthy German. Uh, I'm not sure why German was important, but that's quoted in the paper. Uh, Dr. Bentley was the surgeon who performed the transfusion, and he became the uh, first chair of surgery and the third dean at the University of Arkansas Medical School, where Dr. Maxon currently practices. He died in 1917. By the way, it's where I went to medical school as well. I didn't know that when I was in medical school, that he had done the first transfusion in the United States. You move forward to World War I, where there were a lot of deaths. Femur fractures were splinted was one of the big improvements. Laparotomy became common uh, and for the first time. And largely, if you go back and read that literature, because of blood product resuscitation allowed patients to stay alive long enough to have a laparotomy and survive a laparotomy. In World War II, <clears throat> lots of deaths in World War II, the United States went to war initially with only plasma. Plasma was the resuscitation fluid. Blood products were not felt to be uh, required. Red cells or whole blood were not required. However, the British system used whole blood. And when the uh, senior clinicians were moving around the battlefield in Africa, looking at casualties on the, on the British side and looking at casualties on the US side, and the same casualties, same mechanisms, everything, what they found was that the British casualties were doing a lot better than the US casualties. Now, it's either because the British surgeons were better than the American surgeons, or there were different practices. And it was felt to come down to uh, that the British folks were using whole blood and the, uh, on the U.S. side were using plasma. Dr. Churchill saw this, recommended changes, sent uh, messages up to the generals. The generals blew him off and didn't pay any attention, so he talked to a reporter for the New York Times. And the New York Times reporter put this not on the front page, but on about the fourth page. You can go back to the New York Times and find this article. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the messages to the generals didn't make the change, but the New York Times reporter did. And pretty quickly afterwards, uh, U.S. soldiers were being resuscitated with whole blood and did better. At the start of Vietnam, whole blood was used uh, routinely, hundreds of thousands of units. And during the Vietnam War is when we saw a change to component therapy and crystalloid. Very interesting because also at the same time, clinicians started writing about ARDS, um, uh, made his first uh, uh, appearance in the literature. Now, we don't know if that's causal or not. Did the change from components to crystal, uh, whole blood to components and crystalloid cause a ARDS to be seen? But it certainly is in parallel in the literature showing up at the same time. Dr. Sheldon and Blaisdell and Lim, real giants of resuscitation in 1975, talked about the use of whole blood. One of the last real references to whole blood in trauma patients uh, for the uh, next 30 years or so, and said that in patients who are minimally injured, crystalloid and components are probably okay, but if you're really sick, you should get your whole blood ready. Carrico, Kenizero, and Shires also wrote a year later 
talking about their uh, recommendations and said essentially the same thing. Patients who are really sick, who are transient responders, you need to give a little bit of crystalloid over 45 minutes. So that's pretty slow crystalloid if you think about today's uh, physiology and how we do it, while you get your whole blood ready. So last paper they really wrote on how to resuscitate patients. Counts it was a uh, hematologist blood banker up at the University of Seattle, University of Washington in Seattle, talked about 27 patients requiring massive transfusion and determined that if you use modified whole blood, you didn't need to give plasma. Well, that makes sense because modified whole blood already has plasma in it. It's just taken out the uh, platelets. So do, to do so is unnecessary and wasteful. What people didn't realize in this is that the modified whole, they, they remembered don't give plasma. And this paper in 79 was pretty important. I was an intern in 1985, and this paper was quoted as a reason not to give plasma to patients. But in 1985, we weren't giving modified whole blood, were we? We were giving packed red blood cells. But the message of the paper propagated, but the product that was being used in 79 was not being used in 85 and on. Likewise, uh, Ledgerwood, Lucas, uh, and Harrigan, who is, uh, was a, um, a, a PhD uh, student at the, up in Detroit, wrote this paper in 85 of 18 patients without a control group saying this is uh, how we do things, 21 units of red cells, a 4 to 1 ratio of red cells to FFP, 19 liters of chrysaloid, and look at their results uh, are pretty good. No control group, uh, very small numbers. This paper was referenced in ATLS for the next 20 years as how to do massive transfusion in the United States and really drove how we did things. Very interesting if you look at this review and for those of you all who review papers and read papers, would you use this paper today to guide your therapy? It drove, this single paper was the single reference in ATLS for multiple iterations uh, driving transfusion therapy. The only randomized study in trauma transfusion up until 2013, 14, was this paper by Larry Reed that looked at a small study of 33 patients with some exclusions uh, post hoc using modified whole blood, a product no longer available, and comparing prophylactic patients' uh, platelets to uh, modified whole blood. They waited until the patients had coagulopathic bleeding before transfusing platelets. The recommendation was to wait until you see that. Coagulopathic bleeding, most of us would try to prevent today, prevent coagulopathic bleeding if we can, very bad sign. So the summary of the trauma transfusion data into the 90s was 78 patients, three small studies, two-thirds without a control group, using products no longer available, but these studies drove transfusion therapy for 30 years in the United States. In reality, a pretty sad state of affairs given that this group of patients is the one who has almost all the mortality in the trauma patients we take care of, certainly the potentially preventable mortality. So a little bit of a tangent alert. This is not a talk about crystalloid. This is the crystalloid data, uh, this is a crystalloid data bolus, and then one is just very bad. It is, there is not a single study that I can find that giving more crystalloid to your patient is better than giving less. This, this list uh, is, a, is just a couple of the references. Dr. Ree is on here as well. From the basic science level up through the organ level, through the uh, whole animal and whole person level, if you, more crystalloid is worse for you than less crystalloid. Pretty interesting result. For those of you all who do basic science, you would never put normal saline or lactated ringers in cell culture because it kills the cells. Why do we give those things to patients? I think it's because it's cheap and available. Why is it available? It's available because of tradition, not because you can find a single study that says it's better for your patient. Now, <clears throat> this is your bowel on crystalloid. Fortunately, we don't see this much anymore. Um, I show this to our residents just because they, they uh, they don't see this uh, unless some horrible misadventure has happened. This is a patient we took care of and received 25 liters of crystalloid. Very little FFP, no platelets, and no cryo in 2006, and we thought that we were doing really good for our patients back then. Some of you all who have a little bit of gray hair remember these pictures. In, uh, in 2007, we wrote an editorial that talked about damage control resuscitation, um, which is really just giving more balanced resuscitation, less crystalloid, stopping bleeding early by, whatever uh, by all the methods available. I always tell folks you can tell if there's no data in this paper because there's lots of authors. <laughs> the DCR components uh, have evolved a little bit since 2007, but really have stayed about the same. Stop bleeding. 
stop bleeding. Bleeding is really bad. We should have all of them at multiple modalities to stop bleeding, starting pre-hospital as soon as after injury as possible. Don't pop the clot. Use hypotensive resuscitation and minimize the evil crystalloid. Use a balanced resuscitation of one to one to one or whole blood. Use plasma as a primary resuscitation fluid. Um, increased use of platelets. Platelets help stop bleeding. They're very beneficial, so we should use them early, not late. Reverse hypothermia acidosis. Use all the hemostatic adjuncts to go back to number one, stop bleeding. Use everything in, in our, uh, our, our ability to stop bleeding. This slide is just meant to say that from 2007, uh, over the next decade, a lot of work by a lot of people, and many of the folks in the room have done these things. Single center studies, retrospective studies, prospective observational, international studies, um, multi-center studies, whole blood versus components, frozen blood versus stored blood, funded by the DOD, the NIH, uh, or self-funded and just done uh, with sweat equity, if you will. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the proper study uh, so we don't have to go through that decade of work. The proper study was a prospective randomized study done at 12 trauma centers across the U.S. and published uh, now uh, two years ago, over two years ago. There was no difference in 24, overall 24-hour 24 and 30-day mortality. Uh, the difference was achieved in those patients who achieved hemostasis. The time to hemostasis is 103 minutes, so again, very quick. The time to death was about two hours for the bleeding patients. And there was a significant difference by decreasing exsanguination by giving a more balanced resuscitation. The 24-hour and 30-day Kaplan-Meyers look a lot like that single center study that I showed before. Almost all of the uh, uh, death curve studies show the same thing. The action's all early and then stays pretty parallel all the way out. So the, cur the curves don't cross. In other words, we didn't increase ARDS and multi-organ failure and everybody died in the ICU. I gave you more plasma and platelets. And the significance was at the early time point of two to three hours. The FDA did not allow us to report this as a prime, although we asked for it, they didn't allow it. They only used 24 hours and 30 days. We have subsequently gone back and published papers that talk about earlier time points in conjunction with the FDA. And they kind of have come around and said the earlier time point seems to make sense. If you're biologically, the median time to hemorrhagic death is two hours, two to three hours, and that should be the time point in a hemorrhagic death study. This slide you can't read, it's impossible. I put it up here only to the 23 pre-specified complications were no different between the group. ARDS, ALI, AKI, all the inflammatory consequences were exactly the same. Now that was a prospective randomized study. This is now a, a retrospective study done by one of our fellows uh, who came from DePaul. Dr. Uh, uh, Bernard, and, and for over six years, we looked at 1,400 liver injuries. 244 were severe liver injuries, grade fours and fives, and looked at pre and post damage control resuscitation. Simply changing our resuscitation, surgeons changed a little bit, but there was no new magical technique that we started using in Houston. Uh, increase our successful non-operative rate and decrease the transfusion rate for patients with severe liver injury. And this is what the, you guys know this, this is a, a bad liver injury, just changing the resuscitation to balanced uh, resuscitation, decreasing crystalloid, increased our non-operative success rate. So uh, how is this spreading? It is, it's spreading across the country and around the world. 71% of the centers who participate in TQIP, trauma, the Trauma Quality Improvement Program, relate that they use a DCR approach to the massive bleeding patient. They try to re re recapitulate whole blood. So resuscitation today, if you work all the way through that, looks to be uh, kind of a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, appears to be an evolving standard of care. It's hard to do at thousands of places. People, when I go around and talk about this, so you're at a really big place, you have lots of plasma play that you can do this, but what about smaller places that don't have thawed or liquid plasma or don't have as much platelets available? How do we make that happen to uh, provide the standard of care for trauma patients? And then as you kind of read the literature, patients who have bad, severe GI bleeding are getting treated with a one-to-one. -one. Maternal fetal bleeding is a big deal. Maternal uh, uh, hemorrhage is the leading cause of death. And then ectopic bleeding as well. Platelets can be stored cold, immediately delivered in whole blood. Plasma can be stored and immediately delivered in whole blood, and cryo can be stored and immediately delivered in whole blood. So whole blood allows you to give plasma, platelets, and cryo, and red cells all together, and can be stored cold and, be, and uh, for many, many days. So 
What about these incomplete blood banks who they don't have liquid or thawed plasma make it immediately available, may not have platelets? In Houston, once you get out of the Texas Medical Center, and it's not very far, there are 300 bed hospitals that have no platelets and don't have any thawed or liquid plasma available. So if you go into a 300 bed hospital 10 miles from our hospital with a road traffic accident, maternal fetal bleeding, ectopic bleeding, or bad GI bleeding, you don't get one to one to one at a 300 bed hospital in Houston. You don't have to go to a 50 bed hospital. You know, if you go 50 miles outside of Houston, you're in the sticks. And a 50 bed hospital out there certainly can't do it. So how do we do this? Well, the military looked at this and they said, you know what? We're not going to try to get plasma and platelets and liquid stuff out there in the hands of soldiers walking around with rucksacks. We're going to put whole blood. We're going to do whole blood. So they are. So this is the memos, and you kind of work through all this. There's Army memos that document this. What they're doing is they're drawing whole blood, testing whole blood, shipping it to Afghanistan. And today, right now, there are medics walking around Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria carrying two units of whole blood in their rucksack, cold, stored, whole blood for their primary resuscitation fluid. You kind of look at that and go, well, you know what? If they can do that, how come I can't do that in Houston? or Mayo, or Pittsburgh, or San Antonio. And I put those four places up because those four places are doing whole blood, just like we're doing this in Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq today. If you accept the logic and the data behind one to one to one, the next logical conclusion is just to use whole blood, just like Dr. Bentley did in 1864 during the Civil War for that young soldier. The data about whole blood is pretty compelling. It's not prospective and randomized. By the way, there was no prospective randomized studies getting rid of whole blood back in the 1970s. There were no data getting rid of whole blood. And people go, well, there's no prospective randomized studies to bring it back in. You say, well, there were no prospective randomized studies to get rid of it either. That doesn't work really well, uh, unfortunately. 10,000, over 10,000 units of whole blood were delivered and, and are still being delivered to combat casualties. All of the data suggests it's superior to component therapy. The DOD has come out with a, an article in the Journal of Special Operations Medicine in 2014 saying whole blood is the primary resuscitation fluid and the recommended fluid for resuscitation for the entire Department of Defense. Everything else is secondary. Whole blood shows up over and over and over again. Every war we've been in, uh, Carrico and Shires in the 1970s, Iraq and Afghanistan, greater than 10,000 units. Ongoing today, uh, carried by medics in their rucksack. Why not civilians? Well, this idea is not new. It's not unique to us. People have been writing about this now for three or four years. There have been some very nice in vitro studies comparing. If you take one to one to one and put it in a beaker, mix it all up and do all the lab testing, and do whole blood testing. All of the laboratory tests suggest that whole blood is, has a superior hemostatic capacity or potential than compared to remixing or reconstituting one to one to one because it doesn't have all the dilutants and preservatives that go into all the components. Whole blood for hemostatic resuscitation and major bleeding. Phil Spinella and Andre, Andre Kapp have really driven this. Uh, along with Mark Gazer from, um, from Mayo, the logistic, economic, cl clinical benefits of cold-stored, low-titer, type O, whole blood appear vastly superior to component therapy. You can store it for up to 21 days, and there's improved function, com uh, the hemostatic potential compared to balanced one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one transfusion. We've talked about most of this already. One of the things that's really important is logistics. How many of you all have actually been the person who has hung whole uh, blood products in the ED? Actually checked the papers, hung it on the little thing. You know, some of us have done that. We were, I don't do that anymore, but I used to, right? It's painful. The nurses hate doing this. The, uh, what they do do, and we did a prospective randomized study with whole blood in our center, the nurses love whole blood because you just check one unit instead of four. It's easier to hang. You don't have to keep track of where we're at with red and gold and platelets and, you know, am I supposed to get plasma now? We think that it does decrease donor exposure, no question about it, one unit versus four, and we should decrease administrative errors, which are the most common cause of transfusion reactions in, in, in our country. It should be increased value for the patient. We should improve outcomes. as better hemostatic potential. It should be cheaper than all the different components, and we should decrease errors. So the logistics are really important. This is what it kind of looks like once you tidy up all the buckets and get all the ratios right. This is what it looks like in reality, right? So the, paper, the floor is strewn with paper. There's uh, bags hanging all over the place. Why would we make this easier? And the administrative errors will go down. Even the blood bankers agree with that. 
Whole Blood is, is traveling around the, the world. Norway, Pittsburgh, Sweden, Mayo, San Antonio, and Houston. Uh, our senior medic for one of our ground units ordered whole blood yesterday. It'll be on his ambulance today in Houston. I wanted to get a picture of it. It's not quite, it's coming this morning, but in Houston, on the northwest side, if you get in a car crash today or a gunshot, you're going to get whole blood pre-hospital. Not in a study, just part of regular practice. Same thing's going on in Pittsburgh and Mayo today. San Antonio will happen in another month or two. This, this, the, this paper, The State of the Science, um, by Don Jenkins and Martin Zelensky and James Stubbs is really nice. It goes into exquisite detail how to do this in your center uh, using Group O non-leukocyte reduced whole blood for trauma patients which is exactly what we're doing. So, uh, and then finally, Phil and Andre's paper on the history, the economics, the efficacy, et cetera, uh, leads to this very logical conclusion. So my request to the group, my request is to let's get ahead of this. Let's try not to be reactive. Let's lead the way uh, in this getting back to use of whole blood for bleeding patients. Now, non-bleeding patients, we didn't talk about too much. Maybe we can answer some questions about it. Non-bleeding patients, really, they may not need anything at all, right? Or they need a little component therapy. So we want to get rid of components. Just want to bring whole blood back and uh, use this for bleeding patients, and I think we'll save lives. And again, it fits in here with all the different things we do. Whole blood by itself is not magic. It's uh, going to fit into our armamentarium of ways to stop bleeding and improve outcome for patients. Thank you very much.